Uh, hi everyone that's joining. Um, thanks for thanks for joining us for this FCI webinar on uh, how to become a clinical informatician. Um, we're very lucky to have a, a panel of, of current FCI members who are going to give you a bit of background of how they got into clinical informatics and um, uh, some of their experiences and tips and tricks. Uh, and we've got James Maguire chairing, who's um, the co-founder of the Early Careers Group at the faculty um, that are that this uh, webinar is kind of being run from. Um, we've just got a quick bit of housekeeping up on screen. Um, if you could please keep yourselves muted. Oh, I'm getting some. Uh, okay, hopefully that's a bit better. Um, yeah, if you could please keep yourselves muted um, uh, during the presentations, and then we'll have a Q and A section at the end. Um, where you're welcome to kind of unmute and ask your question uh, if called upon or, or raise your hand. Um, but please do uh, ask any questions in the chat throughout the session and we can get to them in that um, in that Q&A section as well. Uh, and it is being recorded currently um, and will be up on the FCI website afterwards to watch back. Um, and lastly, we do just have an evaluation form that I'll put in the chat. So if you get a chance to complete that afterwards, that would be great. Um, so. Yeah, without further ado, uh, James, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Joe. So evening, everyone, and thank you for joining the webinar on how to become a clinical informatician. Um, I think there's still some people joining, but we'll kick off. So the webinar is going to be hosted by the Early Careers Group from the Faculty of Clinical Informatics. And as Joe said, I'm James McGuire and I'm an elderly care registrar based in London. I also work as clinical lead at NHSX on a number of the, their programmes um, and I've also helped to form the early career group at the Faculty of Clinical Informatics. So this is our second webinar as a group um, and the idea for this webinar really came from our collective experience of people approaching us for advice about how to get into clinical informatics roles. Um, for those starting out in your career, we're hoping that this discussion will help to inspire you on your next steps. And for those who are a little bit further along, we'll try to give you some practical ways to support others who you may be working with. So tonight, I'm lucky enough to be joined by an amazing group of up and coming cl inf clinical informaticians from a really wide variety of backgrounds. So first, we'll start with some introductions from the panel. We'll then move on to some questions and we'll finish up with a Q&A. So if you've got any questions or comments, please add them in the chat bar or at the right time, we'll, we'll ask you to raise your hands and we'll try and get you involved in the conversation. So starting with introductions, I'm James, as I said, um, my clinical, my digital career started pretty much by accident a few years ago. Um, I was I volunteered essentially as a medical advisor on the implementation of my hospital's electronic health record. And on the back of that, I got a, a fellowship at NHS England through the National Medical Directors Clinical Fellow Scheme. And then subsequently moved over to NHSX and then applied to work as a clinical lead on some of their programmes. Along the way, I, I met various colleagues who hopefully will join the call this evening. And I found we kind of had a realisation or a thought that, you know, those starting out in their clinical careers needed a bit more of a voice and um, we hope the group to help to, to raise the profile for those earlier in their digital careers. So I'm going to go around the group now. So I'll start with Anna first. Do you mind giving us a bit introduction about you and how you got into your clinical informatics career? Yes. Yes, sure. So um, I'm Anna. I'm a clinical academic in child psychiatry. So that means I spend half my time doing clinical work and the other half of my time I'm doing research um, as a postdoc. And um, for my research project, I'm um, we're building early it's an AI driven early identification and risk prediction models to um, identify mental health problems in children, and young people. And the way we're doing that is by building an informatics resource, which is going to be used for our project, but also be a resource for use locally and nationally. And that is um, bringing together health, 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 health data. So that's GP, acute um, community care, also education data and also social care data. And we're creating a prospective longitudinal database. Um, and sorry, also genetic data as well. Um, and we're going to be bring, creating two resources. So one which will be for direct patient care um, to support um, clinical decision making, but also um, so public health or service improvement. And the other one will be a research environment, which is what we're going to use to build the models in. 
Um, so in terms of how I got into it, so I did my PhD at UCL Partners, which is an academic health science network. And really the purpose of what we were doing there was to try and think about how we can expedite getting research into practice and also and measure the impact of that research on clinical outcomes. And during that time, it became really obvious that the actually one of the key barriers is to be able to understand how to do that effectively is having a multi-agency or just any good quality data really to measure impact. Um, so through that work, I was, um, had the opportunity to develop a couple of projects, one with, with industry, some others with CCGs, trying to build um, some public health databases to kind of automatically create data sets to, um, for use for joint strategic needs assessments. Um, and actually it was through that work it really occurred, you know, I really got excited in informatics work. So when I came back to my postdoc, um, I spent about probably 18 months, I'd say, talking to the system um, in Cambridge and Peterborough region, just trying to understand what the demand was for similar databases or these big link databases. And it became consistently clear that that absolutely was a, um, something that we wanted to, to focus on. So I've ended up spending the last two and a half years doing that. So in terms of what I do, I spend, um, so I'm not an expert in informatics or computing or IS, so I'm developing the skills, hopefully, probably not as, never be as good as a lot of people in the team are. But my role is really to um, bring together the, to understand the component parts that are required, to bring in the expertise, um, whether that's IG, informatics, um, you know, stats, um, and also really to be the front end of it. So I spend a majority of my time kind of liaising with and talking to people who are providing us with data um, in order to do that. So, um, yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll leave it there, but happy to answer any questions later. Thanks, Anna. Um, next up, Julie. Hi, so I'm Jules. Um, I am a digital midwife. Um, which means I am a midwife, but I work in digital as well. Um, I'm also the chair for the Digital Midwives Expert Reference Group, which is hosted by NHSX. Um, I'm a member of the um, Chief Nurse and Information Officer Network. Um, I'm also a fellow with the UKFCI and um, <clears throat> One of the, uh, the a couple of achievements that I've had over the past couple of years include um, social and overall uh, project winner for of the year for the Association of Project Managers, and also uh, Northwest Clinician in Informatics of the Year, which was quite a nice one as well because that was a surprise I didn't know anything about. Um, and my role is to support the maternity services deliver um, the digital requirements for uh, maternity services data set but to also meet the long-term plan in delivering um, maternity records in the palm of the woman's hand so it's quite a unique journey within the healthcare pathway and um, we start off with one and we finish with two sometimes three or more um, and it's about safety, quality, experience, improvement and there's always something else we can do and especially in the light of reports such as Ockenden which is quite a damning report recently, um, units are able to evidence um, the work that they're undertaking and uh, create assurance but it also provides a feedback loop for women in the families uh, which is really important and one of the biggest things that we've been able to do uh, especially where I'm in North Cumbria it's quite a geographically challenged location and uh, we've got mountains in the way between the different hospitals um, before digital note uh, the maternity notes used to sit at one hospital if someone was transferred to the other now it's in the palm of the clinician's hand so it's quite empowering for the clinician um, I'm also keen and involved in developing the future skills of uh, digital nursing midwifery and allied health professionals great thank you that's a really good summary um next sarah do you mind having a quick introduction okay. hello everyone i'm sarah and i'm one of the specialist pharmacists at um, st george's hospital um so i kind of fell into epma um much like James did when um, St George's decided to do the rest of their inpatient rollout in 2018. So I've been in my role for about two and a half years now. Before that, I was just your standard clinical pharmacist specialising in cardiology and acute medicine. Um, 
So my way in was um, I managed to land a secondment into EPMA um, pharmacy role and um, obviously participated in the patient rollout in adults. And since then, I've led projects in interventional radiology, maternity, um, neonates, um, and uh, ED and outpatients. So I've been quite an integral member of the team to um, uh, kind of digitally revolutionise the way that we work at St George's. Um, a lot of the work is that I do is, um, aside from implementation, is development of the system. We recently did an upgrade. I have developed all sorts of tools for um, mainly pharmacists, obviously, because I'm a pharmacist by background, but um, um, we have improved the way that we, or we're trying to improve the way that we administer and prescribe fluids. Um, we do, I do a lot of building of care sets and um, lots of documentations or power forms as we call it in the system. Um, I'm also quite integral to ensuring that our training is up to date um, and that's for all professionals, whether it's pharmacists, doctors or um, nursing staff. Um, I did develop all those training plans for those implementation projects. Um, so um, yeah, quite integral into the team, but I still feel like I'm very much in the early stages of my career. So um, yeah, I can kind of give you another arc to um, how to get in. Thanks. Next, um, we've got Aman. Aman Preet. Thank you, James. Hi, yeah, my name's Aman. I'm one of the Chief Medical Information Officers at Raw Free. And I've been in this role since summer 2018. So my job since I've been in the role, we've kind of been involved in the development and deployment of our electronic patient record in two of our main hospitals. And that's now coming up this year to be extended to the third. Uh, so I'm also an anaesthetic trainee by background, so I'm part time. So I split my time 60% doing clinical work and 40%, which equates to about two days a week doing IT. And so being an anaesthetist and actually probably being was quite lucky because no one really understood what we do, which meant that I kind of took a bit of a lead in deploying our anaesthesia solution and did a lot of work on kind of perioperative care pathways and kind of the surgical uh, parts of our EPR. Um, uh, although probably my career started a bit before that, about five years ago, where having dinner with a friend and we kind of both simultaneously decided to study a master's at UCL in health informatics. And so I was doing that for a couple of years before in my present role now. And it was it kind of gave me, it was eye opening really to see what I was learning in at, at uni, basically thinking things can't be this bad or things can't go like this in real life. And then you go to real life and you realize that you can see all these pitfalls. You can see how projects are implemented and you can see the mistakes being made. You can see the good things that are happening. Uh, and it just kind of it spurred me on to kind of get more involved in small projects and then that led on to chance conversations with other people and I think over a theatre list um, found out about the role that I'm in now and was fortunate enough when I applied to be given the job. Um, it's a position that allows quite a bit of flexibility and freedom so I have obviously got an interest in, in anesthesia and surgery but also um, I um, interested a great deal in data and data science. So I do a lot of coding, uh, manage databases, do a lot of kind of um, analytics, machine learning and AI alongside that. Uh, although that's probably mostly for fun. So that's me. Thanks very much. Thank you. We have Shazad. Hi, my name is Shazad. Um, I'm a clinical safety officer with McKesson. Uh, McKesson are a large uh, North American based company. So they own a lot of healthcare operations in North America and also Europe. Um, so generally around uh, pharmaceutical wholesaling. Notably, they own uh, Lloyd's Pharmacy in the UK. So they're the second largest multiple pharmacy um, after Boots. And they operate around 1500 or so pharmacies across England and Scotland and Wales. So my role is actually um, helping to design um, 
risk assess and implement a new dispensing software solution. Um, it replaces a legacy application that's been in place for around about 20 years. Um, so you can imagine there's quite a large amount of um, expectation from, from the business, from, from our colleagues in, in the pharmacies as well, to ensure that we're providing the best care for patients, it's addressing any operational burden that they're under. Um, how I got into this? Well, um, I've been in this role for a year, and prior to that, um, I was an inspector for the General Pharmaceutical Council. So the GPHC, they're a regulator, so much like your NMC or GMC or GDC that you, you might be familiar with. Um, they differ slightly in that they do, uh, as well as individual uh, regulation, so for individual prof professionals, they do um, premises regulation as well. So I had the opportunity, I think I've seen over 600 different pharmacies across the domiciles in Great Britain. Um, and that gave me a good um, oversight of, you know, what the um, techni technical solutions people are using, different models of care that people are using. Um, and I think that's what led me to this role. I was actually head headhunted for this role um, because I had an appreciation of risk management, I guess. Um, yeah, I think that's all from me. Great, thanks. I mean, and just those introductions, it kind of gives you a snapshot into how diverse clinical informatics is as a, a specialty in an area, which is like really part of the, why I get so excited about it. So moving on to some questions. Um, the first question I was going to ask was about what your experience was like getting into clinical informatics. Um, Sarah, I, I thought maybe if you could kick off, I think you've kind of spoke a bit to it, but um, what it felt like and, all, you know, uh, what that journey felt like for you. Yeah. Um, so in pharmacy, there are well established roles um, in terms of implementation. So I was quite lucky that an EPMA role um, came up for me. Um, I kind of got noticed because I used the system as it was intended. If anyone's actually done a simple uh, like a system implementation, um, you'll find that users um, find all sorts of shortcuts or they don't use the system as they're supposed to. Um, so I, I did, somehow demonstrated that I was quite good at using the system and I was kind of ad doing ad hoc training sessions. Um, so I kind of got, um, you know, uh, asked to apply for the role um, from that perspective. So if um, if you're someone like me who's interested in um, system implementations, I would kind of link up with your EPMA team or your clinical inf informatics um, kind of um, leads in that sort of area to say, look, I'm interested. Um, if they've got a rollout project coming up, they might need your help um, kind of guiding users on how to use the system properly. Um, the other thing that I've noticed with other healthcare professionals, so for example, when we did our mid uh, maternity rollout, we actually seconded a midwife um, to help with the project. So actively seeking those sort of roles to help with those um, bespoke implementation projects are definitely, um, they should be out there. And if they're not, or if you know that there's a rollout project coming up, suggest that that's um, something that you could do um, and it would be greatly appreciated. And that, that definitely helps with the success of the project. Um, uh, and then the other thing that I've noticed, um, how people get their foot in the door is, um, clinicians, if there's something that they want to focus on, if there's something they want to um, sort of improve, then they can um, go about doing a change project potentially with um, the local specialists or, um, you know, they just basically, they, you know, you suggest something that can be improved and be a testing partner and that's kind of gets people within those teams um, a contact so we always look for people that can test out on the floor and kind of promote what we're trying to do and trying to improve things. So um, those would be sort of the things that I would um, look out for if you're in someone that was like me in my position. Great. Does anyone else have any thoughts? Oh, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> uh, Julie, do you want to go? Yeah, I was just going to say as well, it, it, it backs on um, to what's just been said is, is get in touch with your IT department. Um, 
they generally know what's going to be coming in the pipeline. And, you know, even if you only want to shadow something to start off with to see whether you have an interest in it, I mean, you you definitely become a bit of a jack of all trades um, to, to, to be involved because you have to step into all the different arenas to basically understand it. And then you find yourself as the conduit between the technical and the clinical mm -hmm. um so yeah speak to you speak to your it teams they yeah they they look at you odd but still ask them amen pre thank you i um what before i apply for my role now i remember having a kind of informal chat with uh someone who was in a similar role to me and the kind of the key bit of advice that he gave me was that this role is not so much about the tech, but it's about change management. We're transforming systems, we're changing cultures, we're changing teams, we're changing people's ways of working. The IT thing there, that, that's just the, the mechanism of change. That's what we're using, the tools that we're using, but it's not about the technology so much. And there is, mm -hmm a tendency to focus on that or to look at the solution rather than to think about the problem and think about how we're going to get how we're going to fix the problem and so it, it I guess one of the messages I was trying to hope to get across is that I may be I may be interested in coding and, and a lot of the tech side of things but that's not a prerequisite to a career in uh, informatics by any stretch whatsoever uh, it, it's about um, the mm -hmm. systems in which we work and how do you make the system better uh, not about the not necessarily about the details of the tools we use so true uh, anna um, i was going to say actually, well i mean i think also the other thing is to say that there's there's no one type of role which is clinical informatics that's not necessarily doing EPR, you know, EHR work. It's, it, it can be it can be that, it can be the tech side of things, but it can also be use of data and use of information. So I think also, depending on what you're interested in, is that you, you've probably got different routes in from that perspective as well. But I think um, the other good person to talk to is, is the CCIO, your clinical information officer, because they'll really be plugged into what's going on. And I think the other, um, aspect is different organisations, depending on their size as well, will have different internal infrastructures that are, are kind of have these roles. So, for example, we've got a digital and innovation group, which yeah. most clinicians won't even know exists. But there's a, you know, a that would be, but just knowing that those exist is probably um, a good start in terms of trying to get a sense. And then the other side of things is there's either knowing about the, the systems and the tech, but there's also just having a problem and wanting to solve it. <laughs> and actually, and, and, then, and then as a result of that, you know, um, understanding who you need to talk to to solve it. I mean, and I say problem, I mean a data driven problem. So whether it's a QI problem or understanding how best to manage your on-call rotors or whatever it may be, <laughs> if that makes sense. So, I th and I think actually trying to then figure out what the skill sets are required to solve that problem that you're interested in and then that being made available the knowledge or you know that project being made of awareness of other people in the system will really help you get your leg in as well I think so uh, yeah yeah I agree and um, you either I think if you're going to approach people and that's kind of some of the themes that are coming out you either need to kind of go with a specific problem you want to help to make to help change or to improve to make it real or to kind of go broad and say, you know, I just want to help in any way that you need or shadow you, as Julie mentioned. Um, Shazad? I think it was, uh, I put my hand down because it was covered by most of the participants, but I think um, just generally just uh, approaching um, and being a bit nosy in terms of trying to be an expert and everything or trying to get, pick up a bit of everything, I'd say. Um, so um, I've networked internally when I first joined McKesson um, and externally as well, just to understand, you know, what's actually going on here, what what bits can I input in, and what can I help with, um, and that's where you you tend to find what, where the value can you can add in, um, and and coming what, um, from what Ampreet said as well, um, the technology side is actually the easy part. It's actually the, the human side that is the the bit the transformation that's really hard, um, and that's something that we're going through at the moment as well. So it's it's those skills that you have as, as a cl clinician already. That you can utilize to, to 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 lean on as well i think great
Um, I guess the next question I had was what you found most helpful in your development as a clinical informatician. Um, I, I think we've already spoken to it a bit, but I wonder whether Amman, you could start. Um, so for me, I I definitely found my masters to be useful because it, it did give you a, it gave you a good theory, give you a good background, and it, but that could only take you so far and there were some kind of the principles that you learn but actually getting being involved in projects and that doesn't necessarily mean being involved and in kind of being so actively involved where you're given responsibilities and tasks to do but even being fly on the wall see how projects develop how they planned how they uh what are the common problems that we face and uh how do you go how do you kind of go through uh, deployment uh, yeah, and then also an understanding that deployment is the start of any journey and that kind of message didn't really hit home until you kind of went live and she realized you go deploy and go right now the real work kind of also starts again so you've got a um being a clinician it was useful because it you can you can appreciate both sides of the uh, I say both sides of the argument because there's probably frequently an argument there but you can appreciate the side from the IT you can also see how things will work how things will not work anticipate problems you can see way when you kind of well you get this I kind of almost vilifying the IT department, but it, this kind of stereotype of I to say, well, this is this this is the system, this is how it works. But actually, you can understand why in the real world that won't work. And as an explanation for why people adopt these digital workarounds, Sarah, that you were mentioning before, it it's because you it's hard if you are purely tech and you're designing a system to understand how the system is going to be used. And being clinical lets you straddle that divide quite nicely. So, yeah, that's interesting. Has anyone got any other points? I guess um, we've a few of us have referenced the fact that we're doing kind of academic training um, and building experience. Sarah? Um, so I found quite useful just shadowing other experts. So I've sat down with our reporting team. I've sat down with Oh, I had a mentor actually, so he's he's taught me a lot of the technical side of things. Um, I've sat in a lot of meetings, a lot of change management meetings, um, steering groups and everything. So you do pick up things as you go along. And a lot of these people aren't expecting you to be an expert when you do for, first join the team. They understand that you've got clinical background and actually you've got to remember that you're actually quite useful having that clinical background because they don't know anything about that sort of side of things. Um, and then just being proactive with your learning. If you know, for example, I do a lot of reporting or I do a lot of data analysis. So I've actively learned how to, well, things like Excel. I've learned how to pivot table, for example. I Googled how to do it and it's actually proven very valuable. Um, there are loads of online courses that are free for coding, uh, which I've also found very useful. So if that if that side of side of things are um, is interesting to you, I'd kind of start making a um, a look into how you can develop those sort of skills. Anna, I think you had your hand up as well. And then Shazad. Yeah. Yeah, no, I actually, I mean, so a lot of the points Sarah's just made, but I think I found, um, so I'm doing masters, but although that's um, expensive and a lot of, and it takes up a lot of time, you can also do diplomas or certificates, which are kind of the shorter versions before masters. And often the people that provide masters, you can do the diplomas and certificate, definitely. Um, I found it really helpful. Um, the other thing I would say, though, is that you can either supplement that or do so data camp is recommended by our university and Udemy as well. Udemy, I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, and I found them incredibly helpful. So for Masters, SQL, R, um, Tableau, all of that. And they're just um, professional grade. Um, and there's good deals you can get on for those at the moment as well. And I'd say also mentor as well. And I, I think a range of mentors from a different environment. So not only within your organisation, but if you can find access to external mentors, so for example, industry or whatever, then actually that's really helpful as well. 
I'm keen to move on to uh, some of the other questions because I don't want to run out of time for those in the chat bar because I can see there's loads coming through. So um, I guess the other question I had was about what transferable skills people had from their clinical world to the, the informatics and the digital world. Julie, um, I wonder if you could help start. Yeah. <laughs> um, problem solving. As, uh, it, as clinicians, we're really, really good at problem solving because that's what we're doing all the time. We're looking at a situation, we're evaluating what's happening, we're making a decision and we're thinking about the solutions already. Um, so we are quite quick and when we're told something can't be done, we have a really good habit of asking why or explain to me why that is. Um, asking the dumb question because you're also, I know that's not a transferable skill, but it does work. Um, and being able to and um, allowed to ask the dumb uh, the dumb question that may be blindingly obvious to everybody else, but actually when you are looking at how you speak to your um, patients, you use language that's associated with what they will understand rather than very technical jargon. It makes no sense to them. Um, so interpretation of what's going on is a really big transferable skill. And we're all using phones, we're all using computers and laptops. Um, we just see that word digital as scary a lot of the times. And realistically, there are so many facets to this. Like everybody, you know, that's already said, I'm doing a master's in healthcare analytics and AI. I'm a midwife. What am I going to do with an AI? Um, I'll find out at some point, but it's really useful because it's it's given me so many other facets that I didn't realise I already have coming into this. So don't undersell yourself. Know that you can add value to anything you're doing and just try and remember to keep it. You have the patient focus at heart and you have the clinical knowledge to say what you believe you need and then you can help them in IT deliver what will support you to support your patients. Julie, we need to bottle that because I need to have it before every big meeting I go into. <laughs> um, did anyone else have any thoughts on the panel? I guess it's, you summed it up really well, um, Julie. Uh, the, the other the other question I had before we open up to the floor was what um, everyone's top tips are for people who are looking to get into clinical informatics. So if you could just still it down to one or two things, what would you recommend? So Anna, should we kick off with you? Uh, yeah, so I think the first thing I'd say is there is currently no route into clinical informatics because it isn't a thing that exists. So that requires us to be quite tenacious and um, and a bit like a terrier at the ankles like don't don't go away and don't also be um, put off by the fact that you feel like you don't know very much about it because actually th compared to the normal distribution of people around you you'll know a huge amount more of it just because you're interested in it um, find ways to meet skills gap um, and really utilize the um, systems and networks available so FCI is a great one um, academic health science networks also things like the colleges often have special interest groups um, there's also things like conferences and digital summer schools which are really great as well and then the final one I guess as I said is don't be um, limited by your fear that you don't know yeah. about the stuff because as I say you'll know more than most already just by the fact you're here that would be my top oh mentor mentor that would be yeah. another one yeah, mentor. <laughs> um, should we go to Sarah next would be your top tip? So it's a kind of um, I kind of touched on it earlier, but do reach out to people. Um, do you know get involved if there's something coming along? If there's a like I said, an implementation project. Um, look for things that you want to improve and discuss it with an expert first, and then you know go through the the um, formal channels within your trust, and you can be the face of that particular project. Um, learn about change management, learn about project management. Um, those are probably quite useful as well. Um, Aman, I've got a picture of Hatim having his hair done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that. As well. um, yeah, I, I think the, the the change management, it, it, it's getting an getting understanding of how uh, projects are managed, how projects are run uh, is 
that's an incredibly useful skill, no matter what the field is. Um, and don't underestimate the value of kind of informal conversations. Try up a, a chat with anyone. It's COVID has made things difficult to meet in person, but it's made it quite easy or made it easier, I feel, to meet virtually. It's really enabled the to have a kind of a, a chat like we're doing now or to meet someone who doesn't necessarily have to work in your organisation. They can work pretty much anywhere and you can meet someone face to face and you can get so much more value than you can. I think people are more willing to do that than they are to pick up the phone. So, yeah, for me, the informal conversation really helped me along. And someone touched on it earlier, there's often quite a lot of, I guess it's politics within departments, so within IT departments, but also how between the IT departments and other departments in the hospital. So trying to get to grips with some of that um, is sometimes how you get stuff moving. And I've found anyway, it's um, meeting lots of people and trying to, when coffee shops are back open, going for a coffee with people. Uh, Shazab? I would say if I were to distill it, I would say just be fearless. Um, so I think you, I've I've done it myself where I've you know reached out to people via LinkedIn, DM, DMing people, or it's one of the reasons why I joined the um, the faculty last year as well. So it's it's all about networking, um, taking opportunities where you can get them, especially when you're early in your career. There's a lot of different routes open to you, and I, I don't think you should be afraid to take any one of those routes because it's just going to be to your benefit. Um, talking about reaching out to people I mean there's a couple of people on this call that reach out to me and they're fear fearless I would describe them as fearless as well so um, it's the only way that you learn by approaching people and asking the questions how to de how to develop so that would be my top tip thanks a lot so I'm going to try and pull some of the questions from the chat bar I can see there's been a lot of chatter so it's uh, I've one of the one of the questions I saw earlier on is people's experience of publishing their work. Um, I, for example, I've never published anything because um, I've never felt like I've quite got to that part of a project. Um, but I've recently been thinking a lot about how I can try to bring some of the more academic side of things um, to the work I'm doing going forward. But I don't know whether or not any of you have got experience in doing that. Aman? Uh I haven't published anything myself specifically in an informatics field, but what I can contribute and I have contributed are to publications in not for informatics fields, but for other research projects. And actually you can then provide the uh, being data oriented myself, you can then provide the data, you can analyze the data, you can contribute in that way. You can actually gain, provide insight from the data um, that's been my way so far of contributing to uh, projects and publications that have in my organization. And Sarah? Um, I haven't again actually published anything but my colleague has and um, you'd be surprised at how many people need you want tips and whatnot on how to implement something um, so they did something, um, you know, they did comparable um, studies on a Big Bang rollout versus a stage rollout, which we did in my trust. Um, so that gained quite a lot of interest. Um, and then I've seen um, in my travels, um, people have published on difficult um, projects. That's quite useful as well. So um, kind of documenting lessons learned. Um, so those are the sort of things I've seen. And I saw in the chat bar actually there's a there's a webinar coming up about how to publish uh, your work so uh, I'm going to definitely sign up for that because I think it's something uh, I, I think it's a bit like clinical informatics it's one of those things that is a, you know you think it's going to be really difficult but actually once you understand the process it's a bit less uh, you know a bit less scary and challenging. Some other questions came up oh Anna do you do want to jump in? All I was going to say is it kind of depends as well. I mean, but I mean, informatics is the use of data, clinical, you know, clinical data to do things. So to be honest, if you're doing analysis, you can publish in any journal. But then there's like the corner more tech journals and then there's the implementation science and the change. Journal. So you need to kind of think about tailoring what you want to publish to the journal's aims and objectives. So things like Lancet, Digital Health, BMJ Open, Jamia, they they'll look at the tech stuff. 
but they might not be so interested in something that's just about an analysis project. So it's just think about what it exactly is you're focusing on, focus your journal towards that because it make it more likely to get published and get through peer review and less torturous. And so Kieran's not on the panel, but given I know he's part of the early career group and he uh, also is uh, probably has some insights into publishing. Go on. Um, so um, there's a lot of focus on publication, both um, in people who are trying to kind of uh, excel their career and also people who are trying to get recognition for the work that they've done. I think it's worth saying that in the academic world, there is uh, increasingly becoming a focus where possible on what they would term an impact case study. So this is where people do work which has broad and far reaching impact to clinical care delivery, other academics, and where essentially the project you do isn't something that necessarily gets published per se, but where you can evidence the fact that this has had significant impact in a number of different ways. And that is another way which is increasingly being recognised as, you know, being able to be um, kind of used to kind of document your kind of contribution. And that is something that is now forms part of REF. So people who work in the academic world will know that uh, there's this research excellence framework which universities get uh, you know very uppity about because it's how they get their money um, and this is one of the alternative ways of evidencing what you've done not just publications um i saw a few other questions about how um you go about carving time into what is already a really busy career <laughs> as a clinical person um and how people have managed to go less than full time or you know do other things yeah how how have you guys gone about that aman and then julie um yes i apply for my less than full-time training uh once i'd been appointed to this role and i was I'd finished my postgraduate exams quite early, so that was lucky. So it meant that I had that freedom and flexibility to do so. However, I think now that it's starting to become a bit more of a recognised route in, to do alongside training. So what I did was very much a separate employment. The one thing that I think is, normally I said earlier that I was 60% clinical and 40% IT, but Unfortunately, that never really amounts to 100%. It's it's definitely a good, a good, a great deal more. So things that you, I mean, look, you you have to recognise that you can't do everything, uh, and know knowing when you're taking on too much, knowing what you're, how to kind of try and maintain a bit of work-life balance, but also. How can you use your digital skills in your clinical job? So if I'm doing a clinical project, let's have a digital slant on it. Let's try and mix the two. Let's see if I can implement something in from, from my IT side in the in my clinical domain in which I'm working and kill two birds with one stone. So it, it's but it is hard and it's it's also difficult, I think, because if especially if it's something that's new, one thing I found quite very peculiar at the beginning was the getting to grips with the pace of change from my clinical working where I do something and something happens straight away come to uh, sitting in meetings and then change happens over weeks and months. And you, that can be frustrating at times, but it, it, switching between the two took a bit of getting used to. Um, because they're very, very different ways of working. I can definitely echo that. <laughs> uh, things work very slowly sometimes in, in digital change and transformation. So Julie? I think part of it as well is, my, so my job is, is full time um, digital and, and I step into clinical um, kind of when I need that sense check that I'm not just dealing with the machine. Um, but what I would say to you is be really, really specific about what you will and won't take on. Um, one of the jokes we have is my hashtag on Twitter is the IT midwife. And that's because that's what people call me at work. But what they don't do now is they don't tell me their keys sticking on the keypad or their printer won't work or they've run out of paper, which were the, the, the things that 
they assumed that you you were just now there linking to IT. Um, so and the other thing is be resilient, be so resilient because it can be a really lonely place to be um, because people don't understand what you do. So you need to educate them because actually digital, digital health and the digital progression is their responsibility as well. Um, so just be brave, get out there. If not you, then who? Good advice. Did it, did Shazad, did you want to jump in or I saw you put a hand up and put a hand down? <laughs> well, I really like that answer by Julie and also by Alan Preet. But um, I would say, I think the theme is probably that most people say is it's very hard to balance the two and you probably don't always do it very well. Um, but it would be the, your normal um, time management thing. So uh, delegation where you can, if you can. And um, I try and manage my time effectively anyway. So try and dedicate my time where I can add the most value, I would say, uh, to sum up in, in a couple of words. Um, so yeah, that's what I, what I think. I um, I also found, uh, so when I first started doing this kind of split role, um, I've got a coach, which um, actually some of uh, some uh, regions and locations kind of do as part of training or, you know, you can go through HEE and stuff. So it's exploring those sorts of avenues because actually they're quite good at making you take a step back and work out how you manage your time and other, um, other give you skills, really. Um, Anna, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I was going to say also consider the academic route because it's increasingly, you know, we've got a Department of Clinical Informatics in our university now. So in um, and that just gives you, creates an awful lot of space. And I think the other thing is, is that if you're doing some of the more innovation, innov innov innovation type side of things, there's also quite a lot of grants that are available. So Health Foundation is an example, but, you know, lots of different places where you can get, which anybody can apply for. You don't have to be an academic apply for, but actually that can create capacity. So it means that you're providing leadership for a team of people who are doing, spending all of their time doing it, if that makes sense. So I've found that's quite helpful as well as a possible way. And then I guess as you build more experience, then it's trying to, find, you know, a lot of us have done fellowships or there's yeah. the top fellowship, there's uh, yeah. the FMLM fellowships and the, you know, the national medical director ones. And actually the more I speak to people, the more I realize there's kind of more um, regional and local mm -hmm. fellowships that are coming up, um, which are really good opportunities to take a little bit of space to be able to do this stuff and build your experience. Yeah, I actually linked to that. So I actually, I left the NHS to do my bit so I mean I did a FMLM fellowship like you as well and then during that year I kind of decided that I wanted to create some space in my training to be able to do that so I went and took a job at UCL Partners and then and, and that's fun, what funded my PhD so I completely left the NHS for four years and then came back um, part-time to create space for it so I think you can be quite creative about how you if it's something you you know really want to do it, you know, it doesn't suit everyone but you can be quite creative about how you do that. Um, just before I kind of wrap up, I guess the, the other thought I'd had to, um, to ask you, um, it's not, it's just because of chairs prerogative really. Um, if uh, given you're kind of getting a, a more experienced in terms of clinical informatics, have you thought of any other ways that you might support those coming after you? So um, kind of what, what are your thoughts for people as you get more of kind of um, build more experience, how might you encouraged for you know those coming behind you julie you're nodding so i'm going to start with you oh i i just so one of the things that i would love to be able to do and encourage people to do is not to have the battle i had to get the information i need i've treaded through treacle to find this network to find other networks that become my people um so it's not all about qualifications, although going forward, you are going to need qualifications in these roles. They're still undecided about what they want and there's no definitive title for anything. So look at where we are now, where you want to be in the future and learn the career pathways. So the CCIOs, the CNIOs, there's so many abbreviations that we've we've suddenly developed and not all of them appear relevant, um, but they might be relevant to you. So don't don't dismiss something because you don't understand what it is. Find out what it is.
Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. So I, I, I mean, there's loads of opportunities to. I don't, well, Adina has got a medical school uh, student mentoring program. I think also the other thing is, you know, as you become more senior and you're supervising more of the juniors, I think making people. I mean, you can talk about it on your training away days, can't you? And then people are going to come and contact you if it's something they're interested in. There's lots of ways that I think you can communicate about what you're doing and then providing the space to supervise people who want to do their, you know, projects, their portfolios to do it. So I think there's. Um, also through the colleges, you know, the special interest groups as well, things like, you know, Faculty of Medical Leadership Management, I'm sure they've got informatics stuff as well. So I think finding those opportunities to mentor is probably. And one, one of the things I was really talking to my clinical lead actually was, you know, just going and presenting to my department about my other life because um, they don't, they kind of know that I'm in this weird space, but uh, they don't really understand what it means and, um, you know, hope that might help just inspire some of them to reach out and actually, you know, some of the more junior doctors in the department have. So, uh, you know, it's using all those like, like soft ways of just getting the message out, isn't it? Um, I, I guess I'm opening it to the floor whether there's any other specific questions. I um, I, some, I saw someone had asked about how to, to explore coaching with HE and um, just to respond, it's to check with your local deanery because um, each of them will have a professional support unit and they'll have kind of criteria to, to um, and how to apply for it. Any other, any other questions or thoughts from the people in the call? I guess um, if I start drawing things together then, um, there are a few themes that have come come across um, that I think will be relevant to people wanting to get into the, the area in the field. I guess the big one is that clinical informatics is a really broad area and it's not all about technology or coding. Um, and actually your value as a clinician can't be understated. Um, there's a real value in joining networks. And so, I mean, you're all on an FCI uh, webinar. So the FCI is a great network to join. Um, and it's in that kind of space where it's still growing. And um, I think hopefully uh, the groups like Early Careers Group will continue to do further events and in, in real person events at some point. <laughs> um, there's also Twitter. And then um, there is, as you get more experience, there are other digital networks. So I know there's a really vibrant digital nursing network and a digital midwife network. So um, it's worth exploring those. Um, there's, a, there's a thing about finding a mentor and I found that really useful when I was starting out. Um, it doesn't have to be something formal. It can just be someone who, you know, is doing the job that you think you are interested in. Um, and actually the FCI, I think it was posted in the chat. The FCI also have a mentor scheme. Um, there's something about going and finding experience um, and knowledge. Um, there's loads of conferences out there. Um, one I can plug is the Digital Health Summer School. Um, and that's one of the places where I felt for the first time that I was uh, a proper clinical informatician. Um, get to meet lots of people, hear about different projects um, and get inspired really to, to kind of take the next step. The other thing to, to look out for are fellowships and kind of opportunities to step out of your clinical world um, to give yourself space. And that might be, you know, the also academic routes, as Anna just mentioned. And then I guess there's something about um, making the most of the opportunities as they come your way. So a lot of us uh, through the call today fell into our careers a little bit by accident. Um, now, you can be a bit more strategic about it. Um, but it's kind of fine when you get those uh, opportunities, when someone sends you an email or, you know, um, you're introduced to someone just following it up or seeing where it goes. Because um, I think that's where a lot of us have uh, taken our first steps into this funny world of clinical informatics. So thanks again for attending the session and hopefully you found it useful. Um, I'm just going to check the last few questions in the chat bar. Uh, there's something about where we work. So I think the majority of us are working in NHS organisations, but it's one of those spaces where a lot of people do move between um, organisations. Um, the last thing really is to plug the Early Careers Group. So uh, we formed about 18 months ago, two years ago. Um, it's a kind of small group of us that help uh, push it forward. 
I guess um, we were all very busy as we've already got multiple roles going on. Um, but if there's any ideas of things you'd like to, to have webinars on or any other ideas for what the group could do, um, definitely drop me a note or any of us in the group a note or even um, just you can go via the FCI um, just to get in touch with us because I think we're really uh, keen that the group carries on growing and is something meaningful to the members and I guess ultimately you know thinking of ways that we can get more people into digital careers. So thanks very much everyone. Um, I guess I, I one of my skills I've developed over the last 12 months of using Zoom is to finish five minutes early so everyone can get a cup of tea before their next meeting. So uh, have a good evening everyone and thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks.